Okay. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. It depends from um, where you are watching or uh, where you are participating from. My name is Ebe Michael. This webinar is co hosted with BYU Management Society African Region and Scale Foundation. Uh, we welcome each and every one of you for this webinar. And in this webinar, I'll hand over to the Rupa who will introduce Joseph Kalobe. After his introduction, we are going to hand over to Joseph to be able to share with us his uh, professional knowledge which he has gathered for ages. We will be expecting to learn from you and let this be an interactive one where we expect each of you to pen down or write down questions and also write down things you are learning so that you can be able to implement them in your day-to-day -day life. Elder, over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So my name is David Ruper. I sit on the BYU Management Society Global Board with a particular responsibility for Africa, which I thoroughly enjoy. And uh, a few weeks ago, maybe more than that, a month or so ago, uh, my good friend Steve uh, Kap Kapila Mutombo introduced me to Joseph. And so, you know, we chatted and spoke for a bit, and then I had a chance to meet Joseph and his wife in person a couple weeks ago at a BYU Management Society function that they had in Salt Lake City. And uh, that was very nice. And so Joseph is a very impressive guy. Now, here is my abbreviated bio for him because he's got a, a vast history, but here's what I know. I know he was born in Zambia. I know he put a lot of effort into education. Uh, he went through BYU, Idaho, and there he took advantage of an opportunity, which means he sought out, he took advantage of an opportunity with the United States Army that eventually allowed him to serve in the Army and I believe provided a pathway so that to, towards citizenship so he could you know, stay here in the United States However, he's got this deep love for Africa. And uh, so he's got technical skills because he's, he's working for a very big company, Adobe, which is one of these mega tech companies. They've got uh, operations in the San Francisco Bay Area and two big buildings in Lehigh when you drive down the freeway and see that. But he, he kind of reminds me of um, George Washington in, uh, in U.S. history, because George Washington was what they said was a gentleman farmer, meaning he had all these other skills, but he also loved farming. And, and so that's what uh, Joseph Kaluba is doing as well. But I'm pleased to have him here as part of our webinar series. We love our partners with the uh, SCEP Foundation. We really uh, love the Management Society. We're together, we get better every day. And that's the purpose of this call today is to listen to Joseph and, and have him inspire us and most importantly, drive us to action so that we can improve our lives with God's help. So thank you. And Joseph, we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you very much, David, for the generous introduction. Um, I would I will share the presentation and then we'll begin from there. Um, um, first of all, for me, it's a honor for me to be amongst uh, the people in Africa. Um, I'm an African-American, I, I emphasize this, but I'm African first before American. So I was born and raised in Zambia and um, I really do enjoy my upbringing. You know, it was was it was really great because some of the, the opportunities to, the opportunities that Africa afforded me are really great. Um, so the biggest thing that I'm going to share today is just for us to be able to reframe and also I'll share some of the weaknesses or the mistakes that I made along the way for me to be where I am. Uh, so it's key. I mean, I would like to, to share the motivation, but I also would like to share the discipline that is involved in relation to us in order for us to achieve the life that uh, we may desire. Um,
So with that said, one of the biggest uh, topics I think that have really uh, come to play in recent history has been mindset. Most of the people have spoken about it. Uh, you know, what is mindset? Uh, you need to have a, a positive mindset. Um, uh, uh, Seligman, who was the, the, the psychologist, actually the kind of like the pioneer of having the positive mindset, really changed a lot of things uh, in relation to how we look at our lives. Um, the way we look at our lives could be, um, it's actually mainly dependent on the way we look at life. So that would be the main thing that I'm going to share today. How do we look at our lives, where we are from? Um, just a brief introduction. Uh, I have worked in corporate America for a number of years, but I'm also leaning towards business. Um, David actually briefly mentioned about that. So some of the companies that I've worked for are Ernst & Young. It's a public accounting firm. It's a global company. It's known for actually making sure that accounts are really well, but they're actually very broad. They actually offer all the services. So I worked there as a cyber security consultant. What that meant, I worked with several different companies that sought um, the expertise of Ernst & Young in relation to cyber security. Another company that I worked for is, is Northrop and Grumman, the heavy presence in the United States in the defense side of things. And I also was in the US Army as uh, David has earlier prefaced. Uh, I started out as an enlisted personnel, and then um, I became an officer in charge of a few soldiers, about 40 soldiers in my in my platoon. And I've also worked for Delta Airlines um, in the United States. Delta Airlines is, is well known. I've worked for them as well, um, and it was a great, great opportunity to be able to learn from them. But currently, I work for Adobe. Um, now, the main experience in corporate America for me has been in information technology and specifically cybersecurity. That's where my, my emphasis lies, because when we say information technology is kind of very broad, you could have people who are programmers, you could have people who are systems admins, but for me, my uh, expertise is mainly centric on um, cybersecurity, meaning protecting systems and networks, making sure that the intruders or the hackers don't come onto the network. So when you look at me, I have more of a defensive mindset. It's a good thing, but sometimes it's not a good thing at the same time because you are a little bit more risk averse. So as I inch towards the business side of things, I need also to learn to take upon risk as well, a little bit more calculated risk. Okay. From the education standpoint, um, this is what um, I've obtained. I have a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. This is the one I obtained in Zambia. And then when I moved to the United States uh, more than a decade ago, I studied business and finance. Um, and then after I graduated, I went and attended the University of Utah. I have a master's in information systems and cybersecurity. And currently I'm pursuing my doctorate in, in cybersecurity and IT. So from the secular education side of things, that's what I'm currently working on right now. I'm doing cybersecurity uh, for my doctorate with Marymount University. Now, when you look at life, life you always there's always what we call the home base everything is calling for me this is what makes me tick um i have three boys and uh, a great partner in crime my caller abrahani she's such a a great pillar for me um and these boys also they they keep my energies up or if i should reverse that they deplete my energy because they are very energetic they keep me busy so for me Everything that happens in life, this is what grounds me. This is my family. And, and I'm very, very grateful for them that they are the best teachers, so to speak, because they've taught me to 
uh, to have a wider vision about life rather than just looking inward. I look outward because of because of my family. Okay, so I have a ten year old, a seven year old, and almost a two and a half year old at the moment. Now, with that said, my wife she's trying to squeeze in a girl, but for me, I think <laughs> we're good for now <laughs> because we have we we all have boys. Okay. Now, I know this is a presentation, but I also like to share some of the things that I do enjoy. Um, I try to keep an active lifestyle. Um, I play soccer, um, and soccer is not actually soccer, it's football. Uh, but in the United States, we call it soccer, so we'll stick with football for now. I also play basketball, and I also like lifting heavy things. In other words, I like punishing myself, so to speak. I, I do enjoy lifting weights as a best, as a best exercise. Uh, another fun thing that I do enjoy doing is actually uh, spending time with family, but travel. Uh, I travel because of my opportunity to work at Delta Airlines at some point. That has allowed us to be able to go to several different countries as well to also learn the culture. In, in many different countries, in Asia, in Europe, and in Africa, and many other different places. The world is, is a fascinating place. Um, and, but uh, at, at the same time, for me, Africa is, is number one. I always gravitate towards Africa and also to learn as much as I can about Africa. Uh, the best team in the world is Chelsea. And some of you on the call may disagree. I know two weeks ago we lost by almost 4-0 to Arsenal, but but for me it's still it's still the best team in the world. Okay. All righty. So with that said, I wanted to share a little bit about the most important thing that I want to share about is mindset. Um, what is this thing that is more apparent that most people are talking about it? Psychologists are talking about it. Scientists are talking about it. Engineers are talking about it. Almost everyone, it's, it sounds like it's a little bit more of like a buzzword, so to speak. Uh, so mindset simply, the definition states, it's a set of beliefs that shape how you make sense of the world and yourself. So how we look at the world and make sense out of it and also how we, we look at ourselves. That is very huge, uh, in, in my own opinion. It's, it, it's everything. Because how you look at yourself defines also the way you look at the world. So it begins with an internal focus, okay? Now, adopting a growth mindset is not just essential in your life, it's critical. So, we need to be able to adopt the right mindset. And if it's critical, then everything around us will begin to change. I am more of a technical guy, but I also like enjoy reading things out of the technical side of things to be able to kind of just see how people um, look at things. But for me, actually mindset is everything. And I'm going to share some of the little bit of a history um, about myself. So growing up in Zambia, for the most part, you would have visitors, you know, like uh, foreign people, maybe could be David, he would come to Zambia, he would visit my country, he would say, oh, wow, you have a beautiful country. This is great. This is, you, you, are, you have Victoria Falls or Mosotunia, you know, your country is green, look at this forest, it's amazing, you have a beautiful country. And then guess what, me as a native, all I saw was the hardships and people hawking on the streets, uh, people in poverty, complaining about the government, looking at the corruption. That's all I saw. So this gentleman is talking about, you have a beautiful country. Um, in my mind, what is he talking about? I mean, I don't see the beauty in the country. What is he really talking about? So that's where now, the mindset now comes into play. When you speak about other individuals who have utilized this same growth mindset, 
the things they've been able to achieve have been astronomical or great things, so to speak. Okay. So now I am using myself as an example that even for me, when I grew up, all I saw was challenges, not opportunities. But opportunities are everywhere. And you look at me, there have been people, even as I'm embarking on this journey of moving back to Africa, people here, actually, they're also telling me, well, you have a great life here. What are you thinking about going back to Africa? What is wrong with you? You know, you have everything set up for you here. Because guess what? My mindset has really shifted now. It's on a different, um, it's, an, it's on a different plane. Okay. Now, people with a growth mindset, they focus on improvement instead of, of, of worrying about how smart they are or also about how terrible they are. They say, oh, I am not good or I'm too smart. I think I'm really good. I've arrived. They focus on gradual, consistent improvement. Okay. Now, in order to build the right mindset, there are things that need to happen. Some of the habits, like I began to put away, okay? When I was in the army, the army is known for discipline, okay? And being in the army, I was a leader for, you know, in different capacities. Uh, the army is known for discipline. Now, for you to be disciplined, you need to have what we call directed energy, um, for example, if you deploy or you've been sent to a place where you are supposed to fulfill a mission, you need to stop what we call catastrophizing. Now, catastrophizing, we can break it down. It sounds like a huge word, a fancy word, but what it simply means is saying, seeing everything as if it's coming to the end of the world, right? There are people who are saying they wake up every time they wake up. Oh, this world is terrible. Well, I'm alive, but look at all, oh, you know, the weather is terrible. You know, the corruption is everywhere. I don't see any breakthrough. Everything is going wrong in my life. So those are some of the few examples that I've kind of shared about catastrophizing. Simply means having a bleak outlook at life. So you wake up in the morning, you may not have had a good bed, but Instead of saying, well, I'm very grateful for the opportunity for me to wake up and begin being given a second chance at life, all you are looking at is the extreme lag, okay? So we need to stop catastrophizing, especially even in Africa. I remember even myself, I did the same thing. I gave you a prime example of, of people who catastrophized. It was just like, oh, man. Uh, nobody's paying for my school fees or nobody's doing this for me. My uncle has money, but he's not giving it to me. You're just looking at everything as bleak. So the moment you shift that mindset and begin to hunt for the good stuff, that's what we call it in the army. When you wake up in the morning, you hunt for the good stuff. It becomes your job to say, okay, I don't have money in my pocket, but what am I going to do today? I am going to hunt for the good stuff. Oh, the sun is up. I didn't have to pay for the sun. That's a great day. You look for other opportunities as well to say, okay, I see other people have challenges, but how can I solve those challenges? How can I be of service in order for me to be counted as what the Lord is has intended for me to be here on this earth to help other people? So in other words, you need to be able to just direct your energy. We all have um we all have different energies in our minds right there's the positive and the negative it's just embedded in us but now you know there's uh there's an indian proverb that says the wolf that you feed the most is actually what will be is is actually what is going to be alive and well so if you feed the positive side of the equation the positive side is going to increase okay and then the other thing that we need to look at is time. Uh, time is the most precious commodity that we have. Many people have told me to say, well, money actually is the most precious commodity, but I, I disagree with that. I think time is the most precious commodity we have. I'll give an example to qualify that statement. 
money you can make money and you can lose money okay two things can happen but with time you can't replace it um i've been involved in many different ventures i've also invested in the stock market i have made money but i've also lost money at the same time but if we invest time and uh make it our ally and understand that it's the best opportunity that we've been given, then we'll utilize it. Even the scriptures in Alma, you know, I assume all of us on this call are members of the church. And if not, I would like to declare that I believe in God. There is a place where Alma, it says, now for us to prepare to meet God. So we need to understand that time is actually very, very precious in, in the grand scheme of things. So why do we need then uh, to waste our time? We don't need to waste our time. We need actually to invest our time. Then why would we need then use our time to think about negative thoughts all the time? The government, we are going to find it. If you're looking for something, you will find it, right? If you're looking for positive things, you'll find them. If you're looking for negative things, you'll find them. Sometimes we think the United States is perfect. It's not. I've been here for more than a decade, right? Even here, when you come here, there are negatives. If you're looking for them, you'll find them. Okay? So reframing our mindset is the biggest asset that we need to invest our time in. Okay? Now, I'll come back to Africa Africa, for me, you know, being in the United States for a while, I've had to re-educate myself about it. So I'll share a secret. I visit Africa at least four times every year in the past five years. Because guess what? When I was growing up in Africa, I saw Africa very differently. So I've had to do research now in Africa to actually go to different countries, apart from my country as well, which is Zambia. I've had to go to Zanzibar. I was, I was telling the other lady on the call that I've had to actually teach myself about what is this thing called Africa, you know, as our beloved uh, continent. And believe you me, when I say I want to come back, I have seen so many opportunities. What changed is just my mindset changed because I see a lot of good uh, that is going to happen in Africa, that is happening in Africa, and that is yet to happen as well. Okay. So we need to stop catastrophizing. Another attribute that we need to stop is blaming, right? Blaming our conditions. Uh, another thing that I really uh, uh, saw a lot in my upbringing was when something is not working, do not take accountability. Find someone to blame. Okay? That has to stop. Now, does it mean that I'm naive that uh, there are some parts of the, uh, of, the, of the continent that are not working as they should? No, I'm not naive. Um, I know that sometimes corruption is rampant in a few places. I know that uh, tribalism is also another thing that could be a, a huge, a huge drawback. Nepotism also could be another huge drawback. Uh, also, the 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 trade that is you know the red tape that is put by the government agencies so that we can trade freely it could be a drawback. Uh, massive tax taxes could be a huge drawback. But we can take all these things and find blame and have means for us not to take accountability in order for us to do well. So all these things that we can begin to mention as roadblocks, they are not really essentially saving us. What we need to do again is to reframe, to say, okay, if these things are happening, how can I change my mind about these setbacks? So. In the, in the military, again, I'll use the analogy that we like to say. We say we take extreme ownership. We say the buck stops on you. 
You don't pass the blame onto someone else. And when we have made mistakes in our lives, like I have, for example, in reframing our mindset, we need to be able to acknowledge that, yes, I think I was wrong here, the way I was looking at things. For me, actually, that's the beginning of everything. Now, when you are wrong, does it mean you need to blame yourself excessively where you it actually leads into probably depression? No, you say, this was my mistake. I need to do better on the way I look at opportunities. I need to do better and put on different pairs of glasses so that I can look at my country wherever I am at as a member who needs to be able to contribute you know, to, to the nation, okay? And then the other thing that we miss the most is the government, we actually think that the government will solve our problems. Actually, the government will not solve anyone's problems. You know, the US government is one of the strongest governments out there, but it doesn't solve everyone's problems here. Okay, if there's anything, the United States is actually driven by a few individuals who are entrepreneurial, right? Those are the ones that drive the economy. So if the economy goes down, sometimes the government even gives incentives to entrepreneurs so that they can revive the economy. So when you look at it, at the end of the day, you shouldn't look to the government as your sole solution provider. Because you know what's going to happen will be like you are going to be very discouraged because uh, there will never be perfect politicians in office because politicians have agendas. When they come into office, they have their own agendas. And sometimes we feel like we are the agenda, but at the end of the day, they are there to save political interests. So again, the government has its own role but do not take 100%, you know, vest your life into the government saying they're going to come for you. Unfortunately, uh, they will not. So um, what do we need to do now when we've accepted that fact? We then become our own government. What does that mean? It means we begin to govern our lives. We look at our lives. What are some of the things uh, that you can be able to to work on as an individual are you are you negative or are you positive are you looking at the problems that you have in africa as opportunities so every time i visit africa actually for me now all i see is opportunities why because problems are uh, actually where the opportunities lie. So the question should be, how can I be able to turn these problems into solutions? Um, I'll give another example of a Nigerian individual who has made waves in Africa. His name is Aliko Dangote. Uh, when you look at his education background, he's not a scientist. He never studied science. He's not an engineer either, right? All he did, he looked and said, okay, there will be lots of people who are going to build homes in Africa because the population is increasing. So what do I need to do? The materials that are needed to build a home in Africa, as opposed to the United States, is timber. We need cement. People need cement in order for them to be able to build a structure. And then what did he do? He said, okay, wait a minute. This is the sector that I'm going to concentrate on. As time goes on, most many people will need uh, cement. And then that's the, you know, that's the sector that he started in. He's very, very diversified right now. I know that he actually did, he opened up an oil refinery or it's in construction at the moment. But guess what? He started from somewhere, right? And he also, his mindset was in a different it wasn't more on luck. He looked at it to say, wow, there's lots of opportunities here. Many people will build homes. I need to start then, you know, uh, the cement business. So that's another one that we can think of. He didn't look at taking blame or blaming other people, saying, well, the government is doing this or this one is doing this. He started from somewhere. Okay. 
The other one that we should stop doing is is um, there are what we call inner voices in each one of us. You know, sometimes we can, on the surface, we can be very calm, but inside we are very disturbed, okay? Our mind is, is racing. Our mind could be could be racing back and forth, right? So we need to silence the inner critic. What does that mean? Silencing the inner critic is like, actually, the number one critic is yourself before anyone else out there is criticizing you. Because there are a lot of voices we tell ourselves in our minds, oh, I am not good enough. I come from a poor background. My family is poor. I'll end up dying poor. Or I am not worthy. I must be perfect in order for me to be able to start on this journey. I am not as intelligent. I'm not good enough. I cannot make any mistake. So many, many things inside our minds, we can tell ourselves that we are not good enough. But what can we do about that? We need to be able to silence the inner critic in ourselves. Because Sun Tzu actually said, the war is lost in the mind before you actually go on the battlefield. Uh, most of the times, even athletes, they actually, there's a good testament of that. If an athlete thinks he's going to lose before he actually steps on the pitch, he has already lost. It's the same thing even with soldiers. If you are going to be deployed, you are saying, well, this is it. You've already lost the battle before you actually even step on the battlefield. Now, how can we begin to silence our inner critic? The first thing is we have to understand that we are children of divinity. We are children of our heavenly father. What does that mean? It means he has embedded in each one of us the the toolkit or the liahona of life that we need in order for us to succeed so in other words the moment we begin to criticize ourselves actually we are criticizing heavenly father to some level because he created us and he gave us everything that we need in order for us to to come to this earth and you know uh, use this mortal life as a as a training ground. So the moment every time you criticize yourself, does it happen? No, I've criticized myself many times as well. But I learned that Heavenly Father actually wants us not to criticize ourselves. He wants us to learn, you know, to become what we are destined to be through our choices. So eliminate criticizing yourself excessively when you make a mistake course correct do everything that you can to get back on track okay um and then president uh, monson actually mentioned this in conference many years ago he said your future is as bright as your faith now when we slant that a little bit your future is bright when you actually believe that Heavenly Father has put you here on this earth for a specific reason for you to actualize what he has created you for. So then why would you spend countless hours criticizing yourself rather than living in your, in your calling that Heavenly Father has called you to do? Okay, and then another thing, with all these things that I've mentioned, Worries never built anything long lasting. Trust me, you can spend countless hours worrying about how things didn't work out, how things shouldn't work out, and how things ought not to work out. There is nothing that is that worry is going to build that is uh, long lasting. If there's anything, it will actually draw you back. And then another one again, I'm quoting from general authorities, don't take counsel from your fears. Does that mean that you will never be afraid at one point or the other in your life? No, because we are mortals. We will be afraid at one point or the other. But one thing we need to avoid is to eliminate taking counsel from our fears. 
Sometimes fear could be a great motivator, but do not take counsel from fears. Other people say fear is just false expectations appearing real, right? Sometimes. Don't take counsel from your fears. Now, there are things now we need to start doing. The thing that we need to start doing is that when we wake up in the morning, how many times, how many times do we actually ask ourselves to say, I am grateful, Heavenly Father, that I'm alive today and I'm well. Direct my activities so that they are attached to my calling. For me, it took me a long time to be able to say prayers like that. I'm grateful that I'm up this morning. Please direct my activities so that they are attached to my calling. In a way, um, once we begin to anchor the activities that we do in this life to our calling, then life becomes much more impactful and meaningful, so to speak, because we are not going to do things. Um, even if we fail, we are not really failing because it's taking us closer to our calling or it's actually reshaping us and helping us. Another thing that we confuse, sometimes we confuse activity with progress. You know, sometimes you can run in one place without making progress. So the other thing that we need to start doing is making sure to say, okay, I've been running for five or 10 years. What progress have I made? Question that. Or I've been running for the past uh, six months. Have I made any progress or I'm just running in circles? And some of those circles I've actually briefly mentioned earlier on. It's like finding blame, finding lack, looking at scarcity. Say, oh, we don't have this. We don't have this. We don't have this. You're not making any progress. Uh, the moment you actually hone your skills, you become their people or actually uh, they have become experts at, at, at finding fault, right? Do not become an expert in finding fault in yourself or other people. Become an expert in finding solutions because I'll give myself as an example, everyone who is in formal employment, um, even in cybersecurity, I find a lot of threats, right? On the network and, you know, people trying to fraud, the, to defraud the company. They don't pay me just to find the faults. They pay me for the solutions, right? They say, okay, you found something is wrong in our network but what are you going to do to fix it? That is what they pay me to do. So we should have a fine balance, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, when it comes to, for us to monetize or for us to be able to make a living, you need to be able to find whatever calling that is in your life. Um, other people on this call, their calling could be entrepreneurs, right? They want to open businesses so that they can create employment for many people. Other people, they are calling could be master teachers. They could be people who are very good at, you know, teaching others, you know, probably from the university or even primary level, whatever the case may be. That could be your calling. Um, a few years ago, I was in Japan. I met uh, another gentleman. His calling was just to save people in a restaurant. So whatever that is, you need to find your calling. What is your calling in life? So it doesn't have to be about accumulating of wealth. It doesn't always have to be about, you know, um, achieving um, in the worldly view of saying massive amounts of money. Just find your calling and do it really well. And, you know, you'll be compensated for it. Okay, whatever that is. Uh, for me, it took me a little bit of time, but I've also found what my calling really is. It has been calling me back and forth. Okay. Now, in order for us to self-actualize, uh, or in other words, to be able to find um, the peace or balance, we need to be able to find what uh, what's that calling is tied to. Because if you find your purpose in life, 
work will not feel like work. Okay. Um, there are so many people who have who actually discover their calling early on in life. They work not because they work. They work because they are trying to create an impact in this world. And other examples could be people who have made massive amount of money, but they are still creating companies that provide value, you know, to humanity. Why? Because it's not about the money. It's about the impact that you are creating in the lives of other people. That could be your calling as well. Okay. I've met amazing teachers in my life, in my lifetime, that uh, their calling is not to make massive amounts of money, but their calling is to teach and empower the next generation. I am where I am today because there are a few teachers that have really changed my life. They understood this was their calling and they did that in a very exceptional way. And I'm a beneficiary because of them realizing that that's the calling that Heavenly Father called them to do in this life. So my plea to you is you need to go home and pray about it and find what is your calling in life. I know we have church callings. That's not what I'm referencing to here. There are things that you really like to do that even if you don't get paid, Somewhere, somehow, you will still be fulfilled. But then the question is, how can you then switch that? Because you need to provide for your families as well. How can you switch something that you love the most and turn it into something that can be monetized? Right? I'll give you an example. Um, for me, growing up in Africa, um, when I was really young, I, I don't come from an affluent background, okay? So what that meant when I was young, my mom and my siblings, you know, we are moved from house to house because we couldn't afford paying rentals, okay? We couldn't afford, afford paying rentals. My mom was, you know, my father died when I was 10 years old. I was raised by a single mom uh, half of my life, right? So for me, that drove me at a very young age to be very, very interested in real estate. To say, if they are kicking me out of this house, I want to be able to own my own house at one point so that I don't have to worry about the pain of moving from one place to the other because we couldn't afford uh, paying rentals. But guess what? I used... I used, uh, um, other people would say, you know, unfortunate circumstances as a driving force for me to be more interested in real estate. So even here in the United States, even in Zambia as well, I'm very, very keen to be able to do real estate. Here in the United, in the United States, I own, I own a few properties that are long-term rentals, okay? It's because of that desire, you know, because it drove me to say, wow, I need to be able to own something. And even in Africa, that's another business a model in the future that I really want to get into to provide, you know, um, employment opportunities for other people, but also to build the continent for us to be able to have, you know, the infrastructure it needs. I'm very, very passionate about that because of my upbringing. So I use my luck to say, well, I need to be able to change my circumstances in the future. And that has really tremendously blessed my life as well. Okay. Now, the most important thing that we need to do in our lives um, is, to, is to learn from our mistakes, right? When we started this uh, webinar, the call, I shared with you some of the mistakes that I made. You know, I remember growing up sometimes when, when I was young, you know, you have a bunch of your friends, you sit down, all you do is just looking for things that are not going right in life or gossiping in other words. Other people like to say it's gossip. We just talk, oh, these things is not working. This is not working. This is not working. The whole day has gone without actually coming up with a substantial contribution 
you know, um, uh, to the nation or to our community or even to ourselves. So if there's anything that I would encourage is that don't spend time gossiping, you know, spend time discussing ideas that can build the nation and that can build you. Because the same energy that you use in gossiping or finding fault in your political leaders, you could actually use the problems as a means in order for you to get to the next level. But just like I use, for example, myself, I use my extreme lack of housing, for example. Now I'm more interested in real estate. Instead of crying about, oh, I don't have housing. Now I think about how can I be able to, you know, to, to scale myself in relation to real estate. Okay. So always when you look at the problem, look at the root cause analysis. Sometimes you may have to um, reduce the frequency of people in your life that are negative. I'm sorry to say that, but you may have to do that. Uh, if you have individuals that are always negative all the time, you may have to reduce the interaction and look for people that when you are, when you are in their presence, they make you aspire to be better. They make you look at your career to say, wow, if I'm a technologist, I think if I hang out with, uh, with Emmanuel, I'll be a better technologist. Then hang out with those people. For me to be in, in real estate in the United States, to have the properties that I have, I was learning from people who have multiple, multiple businesses in real estate. Those are the people that I learned from. Then they advised me and helped me. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do, right? So the associations as well, we need to look for people that are really helping us uh, with the right mindset. Seek them out. Um, uh, the church has, has a lot of several opportunities that we can look for. Look for mentors. And for me, I spend more time on LinkedIn than on Facebook. Right, because LinkedIn really helps me a lot. I find a lot of useful articles, you know, to be able to help me in my career to be a better um, professional and also to look for other models of inspiration for me to become better. Why? Because you need to protect your mindset. If your mindset is being fed with negativity all the time, then the outcome may be negativity as well. Um, another thing that I would suggest, uh, lessen the time also you spend um, watching the news, okay? If there's anything else that I would suggest is like spend more time watching the news, maybe that are advising you to, on the business section, for example, or technology section. Uh, sometimes the news could be extremely negative, and if we feed in all the time, day in, day out, the negativity, all we see is extreme lag, okay? I did that, and I learned from my mistakes. Okay. Now, I mentioned this. The richest continent in terms of natural resources in the entire world is Africa. Uh, some of you, if you have chat GPT, you can ask that question. It will spit out. Artificial intelligence is on our fingertips right now. Just or Google, find out which is the richest continent with natural resources. Which one is it? Africa is number one. Now, what does that mean? Now, when you look about, uh, when you think about resource, um, a resource is actually something that you can use to build something that will help you, the builder, if it's in a capitalistic environment, you, the builder, find value and then also help other people along the way. So many people, contrary to popular belief, we are taught that Africans are poor. No, we are not poor. 
Okay, I, I must I must actually on this call qualify that we are not poor. We are far from being poor. But the other thing, though, I must call out that actually draws us back a little bit is the way we interact with Africa itself, the way we look at Africa itself. I'll give myself as a prime example, right? When I was growing up, I, I gave an example of saying all I saw was you know, streets that are not paved, you know, people who are begging on the streets. That's all I saw. And then I, I became trained in looking at scarcity instead of looking at the resources that the continent has. Another thing is that the best resource we have is the human resource. Africa has you in it. It has me in it. Now, the moment we reframe our minds and use the capital that will come from investments wisely, okay? I will emphasize on this because sometimes it's like what I said, money is not the most important resource. Money is a tool that if used properly, then we can scale. But if people are given money and they don't have the right mindset, the money will be lost as quickly as it came in. And um, so what do we need to do then as Africans? What we need to do is then we need to educate ourselves to understand that we should be solution providers. Look for the money, look for funding, but use the funding in order for it to be able to multiply itself or duplicate itself several fold. So... Um, and and that's my my prayer, you know. I've experimented a little bit a lot. I've lost a lot of money also in Africa, but I haven't given up, okay? Because guess what? I'm an African. I was on the other side of the coin as well. But the beauty about it, the new generation in Africa is amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's amazing. The 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 mindset, the vibrancy, the youth, the technological acumen. You know, the foresight for the future that is that I'm seeing on the continent is just amazing. It's fantastic. Now, the other thought that I want to share is when you look at um, um, these companies coming into Africa, we have Microsoft building data centers, okay? We have Starlink Internet coming up. Do you think if they never saw the potential in Africa, they will be in Africa? That's a question you should ask yourself. Uh, people who are in finance hate losing money. They do not like losing money. So they are in Africa for a reason. They are rich for a reason. People who are wealthy, they are wealthy for a reason because they don't want to lose money. So when you see organizations coming into Africa, for example, Google, Microsoft, you know, Twitter, and other investors coming into Africa, they don't like losing money. They see the opportunity and the potential. So then what do we need to do as Africans then? We need to reframe our mindset to be ready when those opportunities come so that we can use them wisely in order for us to take the continent to the next level, okay? So, and then when we do that, then the benefits that we are going to reap will be tremendous, okay? Um, so we need to close our minds with the idea of saying there's nothing in Africa. There is everything that we need in Africa. Literally, there is. And I, for one, see it. Every time, those four times I'm in Africa every year, I, I look, I'm like, wait a minute, where was I? Why didn't I see this all of this while? Okay. Now, the best thing that I would recommend, there are a few additional tools that really helped me to be where I am today. Okay, there are a few readings that I'm going to suggest to you. I implore each one of you as Africans to be able to read. If you don't read the whole book, at least read a summary of it, okay? So that you begin to see how beautiful Africa is and how blessed we are. The moment we start looking at ourselves as already blessed, that's when the blessings will begin to come because we are going to attract a lot of things to us. But if all we see is luck, then we'll repel the blessings as well that will begin to come. Money will come, but money also will swiftly um, go out of the window. 
Okay. These are the books that I recommend. There are several things out there that um, um, that each of you can read up on it. The one that really changed my frame of thinking about Africa was the first one. It's called The Fortunes of Africa. You know, um, a 5,000 year history of wealth, greed, and endeavor. It's, it was a book written by a British author, Martin Mayer did. And then another one, it's by Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Um, my all-time favorite one is by Carol Dweck. It's called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. And then another one, which is a classic, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. I will repeat, brothers and sisters on the call, that our mind is the most important asset that we have. When properly utilized and deployed, it can change our circumstances beyond what we can actually even imagine. Beyond. And me sharing what I'm sharing, I'm a living example of that. Um, and that's why I'm very much tied to Africa. Um, I tell my children all the time, I tell my kids, did you know that your dad slept on the ground without a mattress? They laugh at me. They think I'm making up stories. Ah, dad, you're just trying to be cool. You, you never did that. I also tell them, do you know also that at some point I had to sell on the streets for me to raise money for school fees? They don't believe that. But no, I've been on the coin of luck as well. So I know what it means. So when I'm when I'm telling you what I'm telling you, I'm not just speaking hypotheticals here to say, oh, this is what you need to do. I've never been on the other side of the coin. No, I'm, I, I know I, I shared some of, I've been vulnerable on the court to share some of the things I've experienced, you know, traumatic events where, you know, your mom, you know, single mom, not educated, getting kicked out of the house. No, you can't pay rentals. Here are your things outside. But the equation has changed completely, right? Because I started thinking in a different frame of thought. I started believing that Heavenly Father has blessed me beyond measure. I started using the opportunities given to me, thinking of it, how can I multiply it in order for it to be something that can be used for other people as well to benefit. So your mind, please guard it very carefully. And you cannot completely eliminate negativity, but beginning from today, begin to reduce some of the negative thoughts you tell yourself. I'm not good enough. Or other people to say, you know what, for me to make it, I just need to get out of this place. You know, um, I'm here, I'm a testament, uh, brothers and sisters, to share with you that all these things that I've been able to achieve, I've been a soldier, I've been a technologist, I've been an, an investor, I've been a business owner. Now, the next thing is, you know, where my calling lies is I want to come back to Africa now as well, you know, and build solutions that can be able to help our brothers and sisters also have employment and also realize that in other words, to be able to give back, because guess what? I am an African at the end of the day. And I'm very, very proud of, of, of Africa, and I'm very grateful to come from Africa as well. So these are the things that I just wanted to share. If there's anything that you pick out from this, remember that everything rises and falls in our mindset, and we need to begin to reframe. You know, Africa was not only meant for the elite. It's meant for each one of you to be recipients of all the blessings and the resources that are on the continent. And with that said, I will be able to take questions. I apologize. The presentation was going in and out for some reason. I cannot explain at this point. Okay. Thank I'll you. For, I'll take the time. I'll say. I'll give. I'll give you back the the mic for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Brother Joseph. You've uh, taken us through a wonderful webinar. Your presentations are awesome. It reminded me of my little beginning, and uh, I 
believe it will remind each of us here of a little to begin and, and the opportunity that lies ahead of us if we can be able to change our mindset and begin thinking positively. Okay. Uh, at this moment, I will, if any of us have questions, please indicate and Barbara Joseph will attend to your question. So we are waiting for your questions, brothers and sisters here. Hey, Michael, there's there's one question in the chat from Francis that says one of the major African problems uh, uh, has been a lack of transformational skills required to influence change. What can we do to reskill with much needed skills in order to compete? Okay. yourself over to you. That is such a good question. And um, um, I really love that. Reskilling is, is very important. The, the, the most important thing is like we need to study the market because the market is what actually uh, speaks. I'll give an example. Um, like with the advent of artificial intelligence, some of us who are in technology, that's the main focus now, because for me in cybersecurity, we are very busy now, right? Because even hackers are using artificial intelligence to be able to breach systems. So what does that mean? I need to reskill to make sure that I understand how artificial intelligence is being used in order for me to be able to stay competitive. Now with Africa, the the landscape is very diverse at the same time it's not a monolithic uh, environment so what that what that means is that the challenges that other people could be facing what i would advise is that look at your market in africa right if you are in malawi the challenges that malawians are facing compared to south africans could be a little bit different so I think the biggest thing is to study the market and look at the market to say, okay, who are, who are my consumers here in terms of technology? And then how can I be able to retrain or upskill myself so that I match the skills that people are looking for in that market? That's everything. For example, for me in the United States in technology, AI is the number one thing. It's uh, if you're in technology, AI, it doesn't matter which technology you could be a software developer, a cybersecurity specialist, even a researcher, AI, you need to be able to double your, your hands into it. You may not be an AI expert, but make sure that you double yourself into it. So that's how I would answer that question. Look at the market and for you to come up with transformational changes you know, you are the one who is going to transform those changes. Study the market and look at it. Question as many people as you can, observe and take notes, and then have the customized tailored approach, you know, to be able to, to bridge the gap. Okay, we have uh, Omana, Omana, who, whose hands is Omana. Please go ahead and ask a question. Then I will, we also have a question in the chat, which I'll read later. Thank you very much. I actually came in late uh, because I just closed from work. So uh, I really appreciate the fact that, that we have this forum. Uh, it's, it's my first time of uh, having the opportunity to uh, jump on the, the, the call. The, the part of the, the question I needed to ask, he has answered in terms of uh, looking at the market and everything but i'm still having issues because uh, i'm from nigeria and then you are ready to push to move into the market but the policies it's not allowing you to be able to move or put your products freely into the market uh by the time you you follow the the uh the policy as laid out by the government this morning in the night as you sleep and wake up 
you realize that that policy has been changed, and then it, it alters everything. In that regard, what do you do? Because these are some of the reasons that some of us have to leave. And and looks as if we are running away from the country, the continent. So what do we do in that in that regards? That is such a fantastic question that actually it's very sincere and it hits home, right? I will share my, it may not be an encapsulating answer, but I will share some of my experiences um, in relation to policies because policies and laws, we can't change much, right? We cannot change much. Yeah. But the most important thing that we can do is we can change how we think about how those policies affect us and think of ways on how we can pivot. Now, I'll use my example, right? When I say pivot, um, I'm from Zambia, but I own real estate um, in, in Zanzibar. We have, we have a place in Zanzibar, right? Why? I understand Zambia more. This is another thing I want to, uh, I want most Africans as well to be able to, to think broader. When you say Africa, don't only think of doing business in your native land. Because some of these borders, when you look from the historical context, in 1885, these borders were never there. You know, if you've read about the, exactly, the yeah. scramble for Africa, the Berlin Conference, these borders like Zambia, Malawi, Malawi is very small to be actually, to be a nation on its own, to be sincere with you, right? So all, I'm, all I can say, brother, is that we need to start thinking bigger now. You look at Dangote, right? Is he only in Nigeria or is how many countries he, is he in? Yeah. As members of the church, we are very connected. What can we do? We need to start networking now with other African sure. entrepreneurs. So if the policy is so restrictive, you feel like, you know, your, your business may not scale, begin to make collaborations with other could be in Kenya, it could be in Zambia, it could be in South Africa, meet up with some entrepreneurs there and then begin to create that bridge. And then you could you could essentially sometimes surprise yourself that you would make more money from the original plan when you pivot to the next plan. Okay. Thank you for that answer. We have some questions in the chat, Spencer Idemu dear. How can I cultivate a growth mindset to adapt to the evolving job market and embrace learning opportunity that enhance my skills and qualification? Uh, when, when a question has been asked and I haven't quite caught it, I'll ask you to read the question again so that I make sure I address it correctly. Can okay. you read that question again, please? How can I cultivate a growth mindset to adapt to the evolving job market? and embrace learning opportunity that enhance my skills and qualifications. Are you able to get the question or should I read yes, it? Yes, I did. Um, so that question has four layers to it, right? We have the job market, uh, we have cultivation of uh, the mindset, and then we are also looking at the skills and also self-development, right? So this, it's, a well, it's a loaded question. Okay, and I hope I'll, um, I'll, I'll answer it in a way that maybe it gives some level of uh, satisfaction to you. Um, the first thing, I think, with the job market, we know the job market from the global standpoint, employment, even here in the United States, the tech sector has been affected. You know, we have 10,000 employees laid off from Microsoft. One of them was my friend. He had worked for Microsoft for almost 15 years. That was his identity, right? He worked here for a long time, you know, and then he's been laid off, you know, because guess what? The the project that he was working on was more centric towards technology that was easily, AI came in, in other words, replaced him. Does that make sense? So here is what he did, you know, uh, what he did is with the skill sets that he had, he ended up opening his own technology consulting company. 
right? Because he didn't have the mindset, oh, everything has gone to the ground. What do I need to do? Um, it took him a little while to get a good footing, you know, in terms of his company. But now he's doing really well. He has possibly almost replaced his income, right? So the job market, when you're going to look for a job, I know what it means to go look for a job and there are no jobs. The unemployment uh, rate is high, for example, right? What you need to do is do the very best that you can to work on yourself, to make sure that your skills match, you know, the employment opportunities that are available. That's what I would say. And then the <laughs> next thing, if you can't find the job, then create jobs yourself. It's a very hard concept, but guess what? You can reframe your mind to say, oh, I'm good at creating, um, for example, I'm good at uh, photography, right? I can't be hired in this market. What do I need to do? I am going to be a photographer out there and then I'll create my own little business as well. Depending on different governments, I know, but businesses are mostly actually very open nowadays. Countries, you know, they are looking for business men and women, uh, in my own view. So that's a, that's a different kind of mindset. If there are no jobs, how can you think out of the box in order for you to say, okay, I should be the one to be self-employed. After self-employed, I can create a business and that can employ other people as well. Uh, then cultivating the growth mindset. That's the fourth point that I'm going to touch briefly is that some of the things that I shared on the call, you can begin with that. When you wake up early in the morning, instead of looking at uh, the hardships that are happening around you, how can you then look at those hardships to say, how can these become the stepping stone, right? Another thought that I just came up with, you know, growing up uh, in Zambia, there was a place called Soweto Market, right? It was a place that was not clean. It was very untidy, so to speak, right? And people didn't have places. I thought of an idea as like, what about if I hire some mobile toilets and take them to Soweto Market and start leasing them out? Instead of just saying, ah, this place is dirty. Look at how filthy it is. I can hire a mobile toilet and take it there. You know, we use them in, people use them in construction. That could be another business you can start doing. Why? Because you just changed. You look at the problem, you just switch it. And then it becomes an opportunity instead of a problem. So that's how I would answer that in a, in a, in a uh, rapid succession, so to speak. But a growth mindset is everything. Um, do all you can to, uh, to, to learn as much as you can from people who you look up to as well. Mentorship programs are there. The church has so many different opportunities where you can connect with people that can also help you as well. Look at things in a different view. Okay. The, the next question is, if you are privileged to have the knowledge, <coughs> excuse me, please. If you are privileged to have the knowledge that you have now, then when you were in Africa, and you had the opportunity to travel, will you still option for, for life outside Africa? To be honest with you, I would still, <laughs> that's a very, very good question and I'll qualify it. Sometimes we say you don't appreciate your home not until you visit it, uh, something else as a reference. So now here is the point. For me, I started studying Africa because I was looking at the trend. Do you know that Africa powers the world? I'm a tech guy as well, right? I look at the, like, we just got an electric vehicle. It's an EV. My wife bought an EV, right? Oh, what is driving that vehicle is not from, is not from Utah. <laughs> Trust me, the lithium that is driving that vehicle, my wife is driving to have that electric powered vehicle is somewhere in Africa. And if I were to guess the probability is high, it's probably the Congo. I am not sure, right? I have this mobile phone right here. Eh? The cobalt that is powering this, <laughs> you know, the probability is so high that the cobalt that is powering this is coming from Africa. You know, I have a MacBook here. 
the components that are used to build some of the parts that I'm actually using these technologies coming from Africa, right? But when I was in Africa, I never saw all those things. I began to educate myself about this. So I can't bash my experience coming here to be able to learn and look at Africa in a different view. But knowing what I know now, you know, I feel like maybe I would have woken up, you know, if I had woken up in Africa, I would probably be in a very, very different state. But who is to say, right? I'm very grateful for the experiences here. I'm also very grateful for the experiences I'm yet to experience when I move to Africa and some of the few endeavors that I'm engaged in. So it's a win-win. I can't I can't only pick one. One of the updates in my in my country says a uh, a traveler doesn't have an enemy. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I love uh, that. yeah, we we have uh, another question uh, from Toko Benjamin. I graduated in diploma in mechanical engineering in 2018. To date, I have not gotten any job of my profession than operating a, a nursery and primary school. Yet, yet I have the skill and knowledge that I can utilize in any engineering field. What could be my problem and the school business is not doing well at all. Um, can you can you repeat on the business side of of things? I'm sorry, I I missed that part. Okay, I say that. Uh, I'm trying. What could be my problem and the school business is not doing well at all. He he's uh he graduated as a mechanical engineering, later established uh, because he was unable to get a job, he established he opened a school a school and he's complaining that the mechanic he's not having job yet and the school is not progressing. What could be the problem? It's exactly what we actually I answered this question earlier. Do the market research, right? Do the market research uh, in the area that you are in. Uh, sometimes we are very, how can I put it? I've, I've made mistakes in business too by rushing to get into things without understanding them, right? And then over time, there's what we call theory and reality, where the tire meets the road. There's always a difference, okay? So what I would encourage him is for him to be able to study the market and uh, I gave the example of pivoting, right? So if you have a school, study the market, where is the most need for that school? It could be another thing that you can start doing. Or does it need to involve partners for the school to scale, right? These are some of the questions you, he can begin, he or she can begin to ask themselves, right? Okay, is the school offering a premium is the, is the product very different from anyone else, right? Because even in schools, they should be specialized schools. For example, in the state of Utah, right? Um, the, the medical school at the University of Utah is very, very competitive. It's known that it's a very, very good school. But again, when I say business school, an MBA from the University of Utah and an MBA from BYU, very different. MBA from BYU is highly ranked than the MBA from the University of Utah. So even when you open a school, you need to look at that school to say, okay, how am I going to differentiate myself from all these other schools? For me, for parents to say, you know what? There's something special about that school. Send your kids to, to that school. And then the business then can begin to pick up. Another thing could be collaborating with other people as well. So the, the best thing is, I know sometimes we could be in survival mode, right? When we're just trying to survive. We need to be able to get to a point where we are thriving. So that's how I, I can answer that one. Do a little bit more research. And like I mentioned, the job market, especially in Africa, sometimes could be very extremely hard, you know? Um, but entrepreneurship, it's an open template. Okay, that's awesome. I think the, the last question uh, is uh, from James, uh, Blessing James. 
uh, ask that in pursuing one calling, how can one choose between what is a in pursuing one calling, how can one choose between what is a true passion and what gives money? And what gives what? Money. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Okay. So the most important thing, how I can answer that is life, you know, we are not even at birth, right? Um, the reason why we are, Heavenly Father has brought us here on this earth is to experience, to learn and grow and discover. I'll tell you, for example, for me, when I was growing up, I wanted to be an aircraft pilot. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a doctor. That was my passion. You know, I'm just excited because everybody in the neighborhood, that's what they wanted to do, right? Say, oh, my mom would tell me, if you want to make lots of money, this is what you need to do, right? You get excited. As time goes on, when I was in Zambia, I owned a computer business. And that, that business, I didn't understand computers, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I would hire these consultants or vendors. They would come and fix computers, and then they would pay, you know, they would eat some of my profits. Eh? So what did I do? I ended up saying, you know what? I'm going to study computers so that I don't have to pay these vendors. That's how I actually transitioned over to computers. And then I went and did computer science. I learned about networking and how to fix computers. And then I graduated. And then that really helped me to say, okay, I'm saving money. It wasn't really a passion. It was more to say, you know what? I need to save money from my business. That's how I fell into computers. And then fast forward, the passion has always been, I'll tell you for myself, to find your passion in life, you need, it also requires divine intervention. You have to pray about it. You also have to do what we call a self audit. Look at yourself. What are some of the things that you are not good at? What are some of the things that you are good at? For me, I know that I love helping people. Okay, I'll tell you that uh, right off the bat. I just enjoy helping people. It gives me satisfaction when I've done something good for someone else. Because guess what? There have been so many people in my life, beginning with my mom, my relatives, and many other people that have done so many good things for me to be where I am today. I am not where I am today because of solo effort. Right? So that same, you know, gratitude that I've received from other people, I like to give back. Then I realized, what is the best way to give back for me? Because that's the reason why now I'm leaning towards entrepreneurship. In a few years, I'll exit corporate America and focus on entrepreneurship full time. So my calling now, I know that if I'm trying to help a lot of people, the best way I can help them is to provide employment opportunities for them, right? If, if I'm trying to provide employment opportunities for them, they can't come and get my job at Adobe. It's only one role, okay? <laughs> it's only one job. But if I have a company or I have other different ventures, I can employ maybe starting with five, and then when the business scale, it can go to 10. When the business scale, you know, it on and on and on. So that's when I realized, oh, wow, this is my true passion. My passion relies to help people, but how can I help them is leaning towards the entrepreneurship route and also funding some businesses in the future using the venture fund that I'm working on right now. So that is a long, that's a long answer, but... Pray if you have to, to find your passion, but it has to be somehow attached to how can you monetize it? Because to be honest, there are very, very few passions that you cannot monetize. There are very, very few. I know like my wife loves to cook. She's very good. If she wanted to monetize that, she can open a restaurant, start very small. Before you know it, she can scale, you know? I know other people who like, you know, like my son is, you know, he likes reading books. 
you know, my oldest son, he likes reading books. Guess what? If we channel that right, he could be offering book reviews and he could be paid for that. So there are very, very few passions in life, like you're passionate about it and you dig deep that you cannot be, you cannot monetize. There are very, very few, so to speak. So find your passion, hone in, pray to the Lord, you know, use mentors, ask as many people as you can. And then when the passion is actually seen, people will actually find that if they have to, they can. Okay, thank you very much for that. This wonderful uh, responses you've, you've given, and uh, thank you for all you you've done so far. Uh, sincerely, appreciation to those of us who attended this webinar, and we believe that you've learned learned a lot, and you are going to implement them in your life. Benefits of webinars are for knowledge and connection's sake. Thank you very, very much from BY Management Society and Scare Foundation. And Elder, I don't know if you have any word for us before we wrap up. No, I just want to say thank you, Joseph. Uh, we encourage everyone to rewatch uh, this webinar, to share it with other people. Uh, to apply these principles. Uh, as you mentioned, those books, you can find summaries of those books for the key principles uh, and just start applying these principles. And, and this is the purpose of the Management Society is to exchange ideas, create networks. Uh, this, this focus on entrepreneurship is really well guided and the Management Society is, is, is starting to host a business plan competition that will grow and I think uh, I think uh, the entrepreneurial is a great way to live. So, you yeah. know, when Joseph Smith received the gold plates, he did not receive a key to a warehouse and said, here's the Book of Mormon published in 200 languages. He had to go out and with inspiration and hard work from other people, build that. Everybody in that this call is doing this today. And so don't give up. There's an acceleration of growth in Africa and uh, and we see it and uh you know you guys are the pioneers and you will help make it happen and so be supportive of these webinars apply these principles and with god's help go out and change the world thank you so uh we have a tradition here in bi management society and skep where we give ourselves hug to both the presenters to ourselves to bi management society and skep foundation please turn on your camera so that we can be able to take a memorable pictures uh, while giving a hug. Turn on your camera, please. <laughs> a big hug for Scale Foundation, BYU Management Society, ourselves and Joseph Kaluga. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for all you do. And we, we believe that each and every one of us do our best to uh, improve in our mindset, okay, so that we can be able to have a wonderful Africa. Thank you very much for your attendance, and God bless you. Have a wonderful evening, morning, and afternoon. Thank you.